And this is Bossa Nova Life. And today we are starting our new series, Get to Know. And then today we're going to get to know Viva Las Vegas with the illustrious Tom Ingram. Tom Ingram himself. <laughs> I was wondering if we should say infamous, but illustrious is much better. He is more than famous. <laughs> he is more than famous. <laughs> So welcome, Tom. Uh, we're going to get you up here also. We're su super excited to have you here. Um, I'm excited to be here as well. <laughs> good, good. It is our, our honor to spend the Sunday with you. Yes, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we had an interview lined up with you. going to be the Wednesday night before Viva. We were all excited about it, but uh, we're still yeah, making well, it happen. Yes. Yeah, that didn't quite work out. <laughs> not, not quite. Not quite. So, um, how are you holding up? How's everything going in the midst of kind of the craziness that's going on in the world today? Well, I think we're holding up. It, it's been strange because obviously not having the event and just suddenly something we've been working towards for a year disappears. Um, we've been here in the office. We've been having a very strict one person at a time. So, I never see Audrey. Yeah. Whereas I'm used to her being here all the time. And suddenly, I don't see her. And then, you know, the way everyone's been, be been buying merch, we've had difficulty keeping up with it. And we've, oh, yeah. at times, we felt, fell a week or two behind getting the orders out. Oh, um, she tells me she has a shirt that she's holding for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hope people are being understanding, though. Are people, for the most part, being very understanding if things are taking a little longer? Oh, yeah. No one's complained. So that's good. Good, good. That's good. And I, I, I can only imagine what it would feel like to have your the rug swept out from you at the last minute. I mean, like down to the wire. Um, uh, I've even had people asking us as though we have some sort of inside connection with Tom Ingram as to what's going on at Aviva. But I can't even imagine uh, how many vendors, how many acts, how much talent you had to contact at the last minute and say, it's over. Uh, that had to be mind boggling. Yeah. Well, luckily we have email lists set up, one for the vendors, one for the bands, one for the DJs, and then one for people going to the event. So emailing everyone is relatively easy, but yeah. it's just the getting bombarded with emails as soon as we did that. Yes, yeah. all of the questions, <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, so, uh <laughs> Well, let's start off with some 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 easy questions, and we'll get back into like <laughs> where's Viva at today, where it's going. But let's go back. Yeah. Uh, one of the first fun questions I had because I, I we were reading different interviews about you, things like that. Uh, of all the monikers people have given you, which one did you like better, the Rockabilly King of Vegas or the Walt Disney of Rockabilly? Which one of those did you like the best? <laughs> or neither. <laughs> um. I don't, I don't like the term rockabilly king of Vegas because I, and I just, I think that's, it's not a dislike it. I just don't think it's. There's only one king, right? Yeah, and that's Elvis. Right. <laughs> um, and then, I would say the Walt Disney of rockabilly is perhaps a more accurate description, but, <laughs> but, but I'm not going to open up a rockabilly theme park or anything like that so well for those of us who love viva las vegas uh it's a three-day all-inclusive theme park so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's probably uh, the more accurate so yeah I, I guess uh if there is someone watching this video which i can't even imagine watching our channel who doesn't know what viva las vegas is and it doesn't know what's happening uh, I would summarize it as a four-day music festival with about 80-plus bands uh, focused around that, also involving classic cars, pinup, burlesque, ink competitions, about 300 vendors, and yeah. on and on and on. Uh, I don't know how else to describe people it. Who An celebrate. Americana explosion? Yeah, yeah. People who celebrate. It's a, it is a very hard thing to describe and explain what it is because – if you've never been or if you've ever been to an event like it, then, you know, it's even music festivals of other types of music are not the same. No. So it's, it's very difficult to describe. 
And you've got so many different people who love so many different parts. Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting because you'll have people who, we talk to people sometimes who have just been to the car show. I can't even imagine because I love all of yeah. it. So it's, it's yeah. interesting, the different parts. That and I've, got, and I've known people who literally, like, I only go for the burlesque and the pinup. And I'm all like, what about the bands? And I'm like, the bands are all right. And I'm like, well, we'll pull you in. We'll, we'll pull you over. <laughs> and there's a, there are a lot of people who go who just go for one part of it. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. so I think that's uh, what makes it different to the other festivals. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean. Uh, so one of the questions I have, and it, 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 it's a real easy one, Tom. You'll have no problem answering it. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm saying sarcastically. Could you define rockabilly for someone who who doesn't know? I could. I'll try and keep it simple because there's two definitions. Okay. All right. Number one is music that's pure rockabilly which doesn't include most of the music that we get to hear because what's now been termed as rockabilly covers all types of 50s music in england we would have called it all rock and roll but now rockabilly is being used as the term for all types of 50s music so the music is part one and part two would be the scene now a rockabilly scene could include obviously includes people who like 50s music but also now it's including cars and pin-up and burlesque and everything that it's now used as a term for the scene so do you so, feel that it's grown into becoming more of like a vintage culture encompassing i mean it even has classic tiki right in it and things like that now yeah it is it's a term for the entire scene because if it if you're looking at what it used to be called or, or how it used to be thought of. Um, people are into Tiki, for example, you just mentioned it. They might be into totally different music. They could more, perhaps they're more likely to be into surf or garage or, or anything. Uh, people are into cars, could be into other types of music. Um, and just because someone's doing burlesque or pinup doesn't mean they're into fifties music at all. So, what the term rockabilly does it it brings all the people who like those different things together under one type of music and there's a lot of people who come who perhaps don't even know 50s music and then they get to hear it and now they're thinking oh wow i like this music yeah can't stay but, still yeah because there's <laughs> not the general media is not playing it and no. you have to really search out shows that play the music I was amazed, uh, my day job, I, I have a new coworker, and I was talking to her and she says, you keep using the phrase rockabilly. I'm like, I used, I didn't realize I, it came up in regular conversation at a bank, but apparently I said it enough. <laughs> and she goes, can you tell me what that is? She's in her mid thirties. So I was like, well, the, I go for you. I would just say like the stray cats. And she was like, who are the stray cats? Oh, dear. And I was like, wow. <laughs> So I played rock this, you know, rock the sound. And yeah. she was like, Oh, I know this song. It was in a movie. So I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. But, uh, it was interesting. Uh, but, uh, I, w I mean, for me, I would say like Chuck Berry is like classic rockabilly. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. Um, he, I class him more as rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Although he does have a rockabilly beat, but I class him more as rock and roll. So for Not me, like classic hillbilly, but more rock. Yeah, classic rockabilly for me would be Carl Perkins, Charlie Feathers, Sonny Burgess, Billy Lee Riley, and obviously early Elvis. So to me, that's rockabilly, Sonny Fisher, um, Sleep in a Beef. It just well, goes you, on like that. There's no question that you are definitely uh, an expert on the subject, uh, which leads us into the next question. Uh, were you, I know you're raised in Portsmouth, England. Were you born in Portsmouth, England? I was born very close to Portsmouth, a, a large estate on the outside, on the outskirts of Portsmouth. And and you grew up listening to Radio Victory, from what I remember. Radio Victory, yeah, that was. I remember when it started, and Roger, a guy called Roger Scott, did this show called Cruising, and I used to listen to that. And that that was the first time I really heard the music on the radio. And I, before that, I was watching things on the TV with bands like um, Mudge, Waddy Waddy, uh, people like that, who 
they wore drapes, Teddy Boy drapes. And I, obviously, I was very young at the time. I'm talking about 12 or 13 years old. And I thought they were Ted's. But then <laughs> when this show Cruising came on Radio Victory, I started to realise that, you know, no, I was wrong. You know, these bands weren't anything to do with the scene. And it wasn't until I moved to London when we were, when I was about 15 years old that I discussed, you know, I went to work on a market on the fish stall of Penge Market and met some other people there who were into the rock and roll and rockabilly scene. We became friends and then it all went from there. Your yes. early days. Yep. And uh, I love hearing about how, like all of us, it, it's, yeah, it starts with... Then I, then I discovered cool. that, sorry, then I discovered that Roger Scott also did cruising on Capital Radio in London, which is actually where he really did it. And what we heard in Portsmouth was really just sent down from London. <laughs> uh, and then eventually there was its rock and roll on Radio One. Then Capital Radio also had a show called um, American Dreams late on you Saturday. You DJed on Radio One? I did. One, I was a guest on one show on Radio One for an hour. Um, wow. And I do have a – actually, I've got a recording of it up on my mix cloud. And I'd actually – by the time I was DJing, the rock and roll shows on Radio One had finished. And so I was trying to persuade them to do a show and I was in a good position. I'd got to know people. And so I was going up there quite often, just talking to them about it. And I was a guest on the Janice Long show and I, I didn't get given a show, but I, I chose the music for a whole hour, whole hour and interviewed and stuff like that. So it was a really big deal. And I, got loads of people to phone into them afterwards to say, yo, Tom should be doing a show every week. That's when, nice. <laughs> yeah. But when I listened to what I did then, I now know why they didn't give me a show because I sounded terrible. <laughs> oh. <laughs> your, your vocals? Yeah, my vocals. And I, I didn't, I mean, take the consideration, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was what a great of, experience. To, sit, to have that yeah. experience and be able to grow from there, you know. Yeah. I, so great. that was like late 70s, early 80s? That was 1984, I think it was. So were you more of a teddy at that time, or was that uh, not your scene? I was, into, I was rock, into the rockabilly scene by then. Okay. I was a teddy boy in the sort of late 70s. Okay. Okay. And, but okay. when I, I did I want to see you in one of those long suits, man. <laughs> I, I have a few photos, I do, <laughs> and a very big quiff at the front. Yeah, I love it. So after that, you started getting into doing Rockabilly Weekends in England. Is that Producing correct? Producing show. In, in between that, I was, I was DJing clubs in London, or in South London, not getting a ton of people, and the, then I got one called The Down and Tavern on a Sunday night. Now, it's a Sunday night, and it started at 7.30 and finished at 10.25 every Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And it might sound silly, times like that, but it was basically packed every week for eight years on a Sunday night. That's amazing. Yeah, and it was a very popular club. The guy that owned the club was a great guy to sort of work for. Um, I, I bet he loves the fact that you could pack it on a Sunday night. Oh, yeah. He called it his night off. He was, um, he, unfortunately, he's no longer alive, but let's just say he was very well connected, <laughs> <laughs> which actually made it a very safe place to go to. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's talking about money. I think he's talking about money. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. what a so, great so, experience. So, so then you did Rockabilly Weekends. And well, like, no, actually, before that, Okay. Oh, we'll, we'll go yeah. through the chrono chronologically. We would okay. love to hear the chronicle yeah. chronological. Then I got to know this promoter who said to me, he, I was trying to get a place near the Downham Tavern. And then he said, well, I've got this place in West Kensington, which is West London. Would you like to do that? I said, okay. He says, well, let's do it on a Wednesday night. So we did the first Wednesday night and he said, I want you to do Friday nights. I said, okay, wow. great. And so... The first Friday night, there, there was an incident that happened with another DJ. Uh, and I'll try and keep this story short. I'd gone to another DJ's club and his promoter didn't like me and hit me and 
knocked me about and threw me down the stairs. Oh. Wow. Uh, so I just went home and then when I got home, I got a phone call saying I was going to get my legs blown off. Oh my goodness. If I, sort of, if I was competing with them. Wow. Yeah. I didn't, so, realize that, I didn't realize that Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels was a real depiction <laughs> of London. Uh, the guy that phoned me, well, the guy that did that, he thought he was Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. <laughs> yeah. Right? But <laughs> the people that owned not only the Down and Tavern, but also another club I did in, um, in uh, Deptford in London were the real deal. And so... I'll cut it short on what they said and what they did. The fo- but soon afterwards, I went back to that same club and walked in and gave out flyers and they didn't say a word. And <laughs> when I got this club on a Friday night, the first night, there was a line going round the building for people to get in. Oh, my. And that was just with me DJing because I made the most of the fact that these, this other DJ's promoter didn't like the fact that I was competing with them. So that's, that's the shortened version of that story. <laughs> so you made the best of it, though. Like, it yes. was a oh, yeah. situation, a scary situation. I'm glad yeah. that you made the best of it and yeah. came out the better for it. Then <laughs> I started organizing some larger things at places like the Town and Country Club in London and the Astoria in London. And then there's some other people doing Rockabilly Weekends. And I didn't like the way they ran them. And I, I DJed for them. It's things like their security would go around with baseball bats threatening people. And the music would stop at midnight. And, and if there's people partying in a chalet, they'd go around, and tell them, go around and tell them to go back to their own chalets and stuff like that. And so I actually said to them, I, I don't want to do these weekenders anymore. I don't want to DJ for you because I don't agree how you run them. And and he said, well, I know you'd be interested in doing a weekender. So if you do one, then I don't mind. Yeah. And we'll stop doing rockabilly ones. I said, okay. So I got a place to do a weekender and got it all agreed. And then the place phoned me up and said, oh, we've got to cancel because the guy doing the other weekenders says that he won't do, he's angry about it and doesn't want me to do weekenders at their place. So I thought, oh, okay. And thought, right, I'm not going to give up. So I, I phoned around and I phoned this place and they said, and told them about it. They said, well, we're not interested, but our head office might be. So he said, I'll let them know and they'll, perhaps they'll call you back. Ten minutes later, the phone rang and it was the head office for a place called Pontins. And they said, we're very interested but we would like it at a place called Hemsby, which is on the East Coast. I said, that's perfect. So a few days later, I was going up to Hemsby to meet them. And the funny thing is, Pontins owned the same site as this other guy who was in Rockabilly Weekenders. And I thought, well, they're going to stop that. But I didn't have the money to put a weekender together. So the Town and Country Club in London came in with me on the weekender. Wow. Ooh. And so it was me and the town and country club. And that was a big deal. That was the big live music venue in London. And I'd organized multiple shows there. So it gave me the credibility I needed to get Weekender going. And we went up there, had the meeting, all finalized. And they said, there's abs- they guarantee there's no way this other guy could get it stopped. So I booked everyone without telling anyone where it was going to be. <laughs> I, no one knew the location only me and I said you have to trust me and so we organized it all I had flyers made and <laughs> there used to be this free giveaway booklet in England called where to rock and roll and I paid for them to print an extra thousand copies with my four page flyer in the center and this was given out in all the rock and roll and rockabilly clubs in London and I went down to this other weekender with these where to rock and rolls and gave them out. And I remember giving one to the guy who organized the show. And I remember him flicking through opening center pages, seeing my flyer and there's <laughs> nothing he could do about it. Wow. But good job. I mean, to yeah. be able to, 
to think of a way to get it going without dealing with, I mean, obviously you still have to deal with uh, people coming against you, but yeah, look, I mean, at, look now, at where you I are think now. Nowadays they call that a mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I had a lot of people who did try to stop me and it was, I just went forward doing what I wanted to do. Basically ignored them and just got on with what I wanted to do. Yet there was people who would have come to my rescue had I needed. And as it turns out, I never needed it. So I never owed anyone any favors. So that was important. <laughs> well, it sounds like you also did a good job of making a good impression where people were willing to help you and willing to um, yes. trust you. So good job. One of the things I think a lot of people respect about you, Tom, is that you've always been supportive of other events, even if they're not Viva Las Vegas. It's one of the reasons we've always loved Viva Las Vegas, because the more events just support the greater scene and yes. make more people interested in it. And so that, that whole old school idea that you can't have yours if I have mine kind of a thing doesn't fly. It doesn't really work that well. No, it doesn't work. And if, if you're not confident that your event is good enough, then that's when you're going to try to stop other people from doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and to just know that um, supporting the rest, supporting other events that are happening and supporting the larger scene just grows the scene. So that means more yeah. people he, interested. He's even rocking a Viva mug. This guy knows how to merch. No, no, that's not a Viva yeah. mug. Oh. That's Oh, LA Galaxy. Hey, oh, I saw the yellow one. All right, all right. <laughs> LA Galaxy. <laughs> nice. So uh, what I've read is that there was uh, some shenanigans with the business partners what led you to the United States. Is that what we're coming up to? It's, well, not led me to the States. What it was, um, I was using this booking agent in England and – he was getting a bit more involved. So I said, do you want to buy a third of the business? So he bought a third of the business. So I own two thirds, he owned one third. And it went along for years perfectly. Now I met a girl from California and oh, decided no. to move here. That's where it went wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but I decided to move to California and I said, look, we should do a weekender in the USA as part of the same business. So we would have the one in England and the one over here. And he said, great idea. So I'd only been over here less than a month and he did an illegal share dealing with the accountants and completely ripped me off for the whole event in England, which actually left me here with no income and no money. Wow. So I was selling records and CDs just to pay the rent on the place I had here. I could have taken him to court and I was going to, but then I thought about it. It would be long and it would be expensive. I'd made my decision to live in California. So why bother to try and drag something along from the past, walk away from it and start something new? And at the time, I was looking in the Los Angeles area to do a weekender. And that was my decision. And I thought, you know, what I'd been doing in England had peaked. I knew that. It peaked uh, just before I moved over here. And that was part of the reason why I decided not to go to court over it. And... I was at a friend's house. There's a group of us sitting around chatting and then someone just said, oh, yeah, you know that yeah, they're talking about drinking 24 hours in Vegas. And I thought about it. <laughs> I just shouted out, Vegas. And they, everyone looked at me. What? I said, that's where we need to do the weekender. And they go, yeah, that's a great idea, but you'll never get a place in Vegas. I said, well, I've got to try. And so I set about looking for a place in Vegas. We, we, a few of us went to Vegas. We visited numerous hotels and had a look. There was a couple of places that said yes, but I didn't think were right. There's another one I thought was right, but they didn't say yes, which I'm sure they regret now. <laughs> and, but I wasn't finding the right place. And then I was having a conversation with the manager for the Treniers, 
you know, I'd booked the trainers in England, I think a couple of times. So I got to know him and, and I just, just in conversation saying, yeah, I'm hoping to do a weekend in Vegas. I've just got to find the right place. And he said, well, a friend of mine is in charge of entertainment at the Gold Coast Hotel. Let me put you in touch. So he did. And, and I don't know if you know, the manager of the Treniers, that was his small sort of sideline. He was also Liberace's manager. And for anyone who watches the um, Producers Guild um, Awards, every year they do an award called the Seymour Heller Award. Right? Seymour Heller was the Treniers manager. That's who I was talking to. And I had no idea about <laughs> him being a movie producer or anything. And so he's the one who's responsible for me getting the place in Vegas. That's amazing. Uh, what a great story. And yeah. just stick into it. And so, in the end, it worked out well. So what year was the first year of you? Then like 92? 98. 98. Okay. 98. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 2000. So I moved, moved here in 1996. Went to see the Gold Coast in 1997. And I remember getting there. And we went and checked into the hotel room. And they said, oh, your room's been comped. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. No one had ever given me a free hotel room before. So we spent the night. And then the following morning, we had the meeting. Went into the room. And there's this long table with the heads of all the departments around this long table. And I felt very intimidated because this had never, never been this situation before. We went in, sat down, and this big guy stood up at the end of the table, and he said, hello, my name's Dick. I'm the head of security here. Just so you know, I used to be with the FBI. So we've been onto the FBI. We've had, they've been onto Scotland Yard, and we've had you checked out. Oh, wow. Right? <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> but you were clear. Asking. You were clear. Yeah. <laughs> they'd, made, they'd done their homework on me. And so basically, I wasn't trying to sell them or sort of tell them what I'd done. They just wanted to know what I wanted to do. So they already knew what you had done in the past over yeah. there. Nice. So um, went through everything and they said, well, it sounds okay. And when would you want to do this? And normally everyone goes in and says, oh, I want to have this holiday weekend or that holiday weekend. I just said, what's your quietest weekend of the year? And they said, the quietest? I said, yeah. They said, Easter. I said, okay, let's do it on Easter weekend. <laughs> because it makes sense. If a place is already busy, then why should they give up a whole hotel yeah. when they're busy? <clears throat> Whereas if you take their quietest weekend, you get treated, I get treated better, the customers get treated better, the prices are cheaper, and that's my theory. I can't even imagine what uh, the Orleans must be like on an Easter, if there was no Viva, this year must have been brutal. For well, them. I think they were oh, obviously well, they were close. <laughs> yeah, they were close. Well, Easter's not the quietest weekend of the year in Vegas anymore. What is the quietest? I don't know. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, is it because you brought that you brought the party to maybe. Vegas for Easter now? Um, it might be in a roundabout way because now there's other things happening in Vegas on that weekend, and. I think Easter's become more of a time when families go away and so people are going to Vegas. Mm, that makes sense. We always joke about how we like to spend Easter in yeah. Vegas. <laughs> go, our, to, go to church Our family every year is like, are you going to come to church with us on Easter sometime soon? And I'm always like, I'm going to be in <laughs> Vegas probably nursing a hangover, but all yeah. right. <laughs> we'll be at the pool party. <laughs> so So uh, <clears throat> the early days of the Gold Coast, yeah. Did you at that time foresee the car show being the size it is, the burlesque events, all of that, or were you still trying to be straight down the road just a rockabilly weekend? At the, at the time, we thought it was just going to be music. The cars were really just a place for people to park their cars safely, and we didn't have burlesque on the first one. Mm -hmm. I think we so started it was more like a, just a traditional <laughs> European rockabilly weekend then. Yes, it was. And um, we tried a pin-up sort of contest. 
along the same lines as what we used to do in Hemsby, and it didn't really work out um, because of the difference in cultures. Mm. So what I've isn't got, that like over there? Well, girls would be standing on the stage taking their clothes off. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> wait, a I mean, wait a second, Tom. <laughs> Come on, Lola. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, it is. Interesting. I don't well, even need to dance like we're last. It, is. it wasn't a sit. It wasn't a sit. It wasn't a pinup contest. It was a, a Miss Hemsby competition. It was all just for fun, and yeah. there that's, wasn't a prize. The there wasn't a Audi fight. rockabilly right there. Yeah, that is. Yeah, Not it was more Audi. just drunken fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I would I would have a great time there too. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, obviously you were there for what eight years, nine years at the Gold Coast. No, I think it was ten, ten or eleven. Ten. So it's been ten there and ten, eleven, I guess. At, yeah, at the Orleans. Okay. And then I got. A, I'm trying to remember who it was. Someone said someone about doing a burlesque show, and it, I can't remember her name, but it was a girl from San Diego. I said the Jean Rose Burlesque Review, I think they were called. And they did a burlesque show. And it went down okay. And it seemed to be a better thing to it sort of took the place of our like Miss V Las Vegas competition we tried to do. Yeah. And then I thought, well, instead of because I didn't want it to be the same every year. So I thought, why don't I just do a burlesque competition? And no one had done a burlesque competition before. I don't know if you knew that. Viva yeah. Las Vegas was the first. Really? That's yeah. Awesome. That's pretty amazing. So what yeah. was the turnout? Was, was it a pretty big turnout from the get-go? Well, people... it was run very loosely. Basically, to enter the burlesque competition, you had to be at the side of the stage 15 minutes before it started. <laughs> that was it. I, I, there are some pinup competitions that work that way at car shows yeah. to this day. Like, what are yeah. your credentials? I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And there was girls who had never done any burlesque before were entering, as well as people who'd been um, in the burlesque scene for a while. And that's how it started. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that we were the first burlesque competition. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. Um, well, that's, uh, that is pretty amazing to have under your belt. To so, say yeah. that. so now you you have four staff, is that correct? Full-time staff. Four full-time staff. There's three of us who are full-time, me, Audrey, and Ruby Ann. Okay, that's right. Ma uh, Madeline's not around anymore. Is that well, she's still around, but she's yeah, still around. around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so did, when did Audrey come on board? Because I know, obviously, she's a huge burlesque influence. Uh, she came on board. Um, she entered the competition. She entered the competition round about number seven, I think. Fever, okay. the, fever number seven. And that's when I got to know her. And we became friends. Um, she was always trying to persuade me to do burlesque bingo. <laughs> and, and I, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that much. And then... Then what happened? God, I'm trying to remember exactly the whole in, what happened, but then Victoria Vengeance and Rene Larue they said to me, "We'll run the competition properly for you." So I said, "Okay." So they did, and so they were running the competition to make it more organised, and that definitely improved it. And then, um, then Rene dropped out, and Victoria Vengeance was running the competition, and she suggested doing a burlesque show. And so we started doing that. And like the that showcase? Took, yeah, the showcase. Okay. That took that to another level and definitely Im improved the showcase and the competition. And then she decided she couldn't take it any further, so she dropped out. And by then, Audrey was working for me here in the office. And so we talked, and she told me all her ideas. said, okay. Right, let's do it. Yeah. And so that's when Audrey took over running all the burlesque for Viva. And we haven't looked back since. Well, wow. she does a fantastic job. Yeah, she um, does. 
as from from burlesque bingo which is a smash hit even oh, yeah. with people yes. who don't love burlesque it's kind of a gateway her, but her, gateway her, burlesque. her character <laughs> is on point yeah well, the first her. time she did burlesque bingo at viva we did it in the showroom and oh that would be huge <laughs> yeah and it was i'll never forget that that moment when she did that burlesque bingo because i was supposed to be doing the music for her from the back, you know, playing the CD. And I got a message that my now ex-wife had got in a fight with uh, <laughs> Satan's angel. What? Oh, no. Right? So I had to go out and see what was going on. <laughs> and, Did you drop the ball? Were you not a very good uh, DJ for that? <laughs> well, I made sure the sound engineer knew what to do, so he took care of it. And and it hadn't actually been a fight. Well, I won't go into the whole story about it. But yes, they had a little um, interaction, and so. <laughs> but we realised that Burles Bingo didn't. The showroom wasn't right for it. Yeah, it's it, much more it, intimate. It must have been a yeah. madhouse in there with a full showroom of people. I can't even or imagine. just being yeah. too far back, I feel. I mean, I, I know that it's one of the events that definitely packs out every single time, but yeah. that's also so, kind of the joy of it is that yeah, you have you, to, you want them in you have to try to get in. So. Yeah, so we decided to do the multiple shows in the Deluxe Club, and obviously it's been a massive hit, and uh, doing five or six performances each. I think she, she, yeah. yeah, I couldn't believe how many they're doing this last year. Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, I love to hear just from the, the beginning on through. Um, so you talked about the car show and, um, what it started as. So knowing that that's a big part of what Viva is today, can you tell us your beginning with cars? What was your first classic car? What got you into them yourself? I, I had a few sort of old classic cars in England. Um, my favorite one was actually a 19... 62 i think it was um mark two no, sorry mark three zephyr oh ford ford zephyr yeah, yeah. But the english one and it was absolutely immaculate yeah it's totally untouched low mileage and someone drove into it oh uh, my. And uh -oh. so i tended to have i didn't have old american classic cars in england i didn't do that till i moved over here um and um, I didn't have the place to really store cars there. Oh, yeah. They're they're hard to drive around over there too. Yeah. And I also had this thing called in England a uh, uh, Bandon Pla Princess Four Liter R, which was this big sort of car. <laughs> it was basically it was an Austin, but a big okay. one, all red leather and wood with this four liter Rolls Royce engine in it. A straight six. I'm gonna have to Again, look I bought this thing in immaculate condition, and I wish I'd never sold it because it was a nice car. It's one uh, of those things you kick yourself over. So, what's your yeah. what's your what's your favorite car today? I, I think you own several. Do you own yeah. several classic cars? Oh yeah. Yes, I do now. <laughs> I have a 1941 Mercury convertible which has, I think it's a 7.2 litre LS6 engine in it. I've got it's been upgraded. My, a 1958 Dodge Custom Royal Lancer, which is the one that's been mildly customised, or perhaps not mildly, with the double fins on the back, but it's been customised. I've got the 1958 Cadillac, which has the V Las Vegas down the side. Yes. And I also own, have you seen the... Um, blue Cadillac that's for the Atomic Style Lounge in Vegas. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I didn't yeah. know that was yours, actually. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's Until beautiful. just like the last year, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 That was, that's beautiful. And, and then, then I've got also... Two, go ahead, Tom. Two classic motorbikes. That's what I was going to ask you about, yeah. What the 1956 they? BSA Golden Flash. Oh, BSA. Ah. And a 1959 Matchless G12. 
<laughs> you so you love uh, well-made vehicles, yes. obviously, and I think that's wonderful. You have um, you have some cred, some street cred. So when you are putting together this car, these car shows, um, I've heard that from different people in the event that you um, are a big part of what cars are let in, or that you get to choose some of them. How does that work? Um, yes, what it is, the criteria for the car show were very strict because it has to represent the event. And remember the event is always music first. So the, the music can't be led by the car show. Music has to lead the car show. So the cars have to be what younger people of that time would have been driving around. Mm -hmm. It's oh, as simple like as that. that. Yeah. In the style they would have been. The only exceptions we make, um, is in the 50s and early 60s, people didn't take the fenders off late 30s pickups, trucks. Oh, yeah. That's a more modern thing. But if someone does one of those trucks in the style that's correct, as it would have been done then if they had done it, then we're okay. And the reason for that is that a lot of vintage cars are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you can still pick up a truck for a reasonable price for a pickup. So yeah. that's, that's why, why they love the tournament of rat rods anymore. Well, they're so, that's why they're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do appreciate giving some opportunity for maybe younger people who don't have a lot of money yeah. and getting into the scene, giving them a venue also. Well, I, I, it, doesn't, I, it doesn't mean we're going to allow – <laughs> rat rods no yeah no <laughs> yeah. no i've had guys arguing with me about that they're like why doesn't tom allow in rat rods and my answer has always been because it's tom show he can do what he wants like, I, don't, I don't know it's not really a big debate to me there's a there's a yeah. plenty of other rat rod shows you're not gonna like yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and you know we've i've seen some unbelievable things that people have submitted oh, yeah. There was a, well, to, well, tools to the door, and for no reason. A plastic gas can sitting on the top of the on the roof with a tube going down for the gas. <laughs> and so, like a Mad Max. Car. It's, dang, it's dangerous. We can't have that. Yeah. yeah. But there's one submission from what would have been this year, which I have to tell you about. It was a ninety. Sorry, two thousand twelve. Ford, oh, what is it called again? The, the the average sedan. Yeah. Ford, um, like a tempo or something or. Something? No. I don't know modern cars at all. I don't all. know the modern. Yeah. Cars. Okay, so 2012 Ford. Let's call it that. Okay. okay. Completely covered in red and white rhinestones. <laughs> Why? Completely covered in wine. He's gonna bring it in. He wanted to bring it to the car oh, show. He wanted to, but you didn't. Oh, we we denied it. Yeah. Okay. He didn't understand why. He said it's what Vegas is all about. <laughs> and I said, the number one rule: cars have to be built before 1964. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people they they hear Viva Las Vegas, they go to it, they're like pretty girls, whatever. But the best way I've described it to people is. Is it's the ve it's what I wish Vegas was. It's the only time of year that yeah. we would ever go to Vegas. Like the the Vegas now, the Strip, all the modern Vegas has no appeal to us. But the the, the Elvis Vegas, the Frank Sinatra Vegas, the Dean yeah. Martin Vegas. Mm -hmm. If I could hang out the Rat Pack, I'd be all about it. Just a throwback. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's what we want Vegas yeah. to be. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. That, that's classic. Vegas. Yeah. Old school. Yeah. So he yeah. might be right. Maybe that car represents modern Vegas, for sure. <laughs> the strip. <laughs> or yeah. I can see Ford that. Focus. That was it. It was a Ford oh, Focus. Ford Focus. <laughs> Ford Focus. Oh wow. my goodness. Oh. Well, I'm mean, good for that person, hey, hey, but <laughs> he got an E for effort. An E for effort. So uh, <laughs> today, uh, this last year. Is it twenty five thousand people? How many how many people are going these days? About seventeen or eighteen thousand. Seventeen or eighteen thousand, okay. Yeah. Did, did it peak out? That, the yeah, that's what it peaks at on the Saturday. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it's less than that on the Thursday, it goes up on the Friday, on the Saturday it peaks, and then it comes down a bit on the Sunday. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh 
so 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 to us, one of our dear and dear events, because there's so many going on at Viva, is obviously the pool party, which yeah. has gone to three full days now, and, and you're bringing in surf rock bands and and even like some borderline exotica bands. Is do you, are you seeing that that side grow as well? Yes, I just wish we had a bigger pool area. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's such a draw um, for us because it is Easter weekend, and so it's we're from the Pacific Northwest. It's cold. We are so happy <laughs> we to go, go we, someplace where we can go be back outside. To the right yeah, I, I've heard yeah. there's places that are cold in USA. <laughs> I know you, <laughs> dog, you. We're still on the West Coast, best coast though. So Imagine. I think we have. I think we have the same weather as um, London. So just remember Actually, that for those days. England, <laughs> uh, England, and Portland. Metro has a very similar climate. climate. Yeah. Huh. We're south of Portland, though, so we get a little warm, more warm than they do. Um, though I do hear Portland is a very nice place to live. It is. It is, yes. Um, but so, yes, we appreciate it, and it would be a fantastic if it was a bigger pool area. But as far as, like, the surf rock bands, um, do you get a lot of good feedback? Because we love them. Yeah. We love Tiki uh, also. I do, because surf music sort of came right after – rock and roll and so it's still got its roots in the 50s music so i i think it's part of the scene and mm -hmm. and if you think about it, you're listening to if all weekend inside you're listening to rock and roll rockabilly and rhythm and blues to have something a little bit different out at the pool party just makes it just makes it a little bit different to the rest of the show which is what you want. You don't want the same thing all weekend. Yeah. Oh, that brings me to one of my favorite uh, favorite times from last VLV was at the new piano bar. You had a big band there, didn't you? You had a big swing band big swing in band? there from like San Francisco. Which one? Was it the Alpha Rhythm Kings? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was, and it fit the and venue. she went crazy yeah, for the, it. Well, it I felt the, it fit the scene. It fit the venue perfectly. It was, yeah. it was like you were in like an old nightclub. It was, it was a great choice for that venue, and I, everybody who was there was having a blast. So. And I'll tell you what, they were one of the easiest bands to deal with. Oh, oh well, so, good. Such nice guys. <laughs> Friendly and everything. I will always tell you who's easy to deal with, but I won't tell you who's not. <laughs> yeah that's good good business <laughs> i would say one of my favorite memories uh which i was reading apparently is one of yours as well uh was oh my goodness is i think we've been going for 11 years i can't i can't remember which year it was anymore three four or five years ago they did the sun records tribute yes and mm. i was so exhausted i've been shooting video all day she had gone to bed in in the hotel room i'm like i'm gonna go out and see what's up. And I wandered into there, and my grandfather was a square dance caller in the 50s and 60s, and I grew up with a ton of that. And I hadn't even looked at the thing to see what was going on, and just walking into that was unexpected and an amazing evening. So, yeah. You thank you. So excited. Yeah, that um, was – doing that was financial madness. <laughs> <laughs> you had so many people that kept bringing them out on the stage. I, I don't know if you know that Sun Rockabilly is my favorite type of music. And so, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah, with all the old acts dying off so much, so fast yeah. now, it was a now or never situation. So I just wanted to do the best sun show I could. And it was, I'm glad I did it. And just before, sorry, just after the show, when they were doing photographs, and it was all the acts, and then myself, and Ruby Ann was there, did all the photos, and then Johnny Powers said to me, he goes, this will never happen again. Yeah. No. To be a part I was of actually time. texting friends. I'm like, I can't believe I'm here for this, because these guys aren't going to come back out again. Like, a bunch of these guys aren't going to make it. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And it was so, an amazing yeah, evening. Yeah, there were some other ones who I tried to get, but they just physically couldn't make the trip. Yeah. Said. Yeah. Um, I, that kind of leads into a question I had for you. And um, we just adore seeing acts that we are, we're so excited to see them in person because they are somebody we've listened to for so long. But also finding the new acts and finding new bands. Um, we always have a good time just kind of wandering around and finding some great new bands. Where do you see the rockabilly 
bands and scene going with this next wave of younger people coming in and new bands coming out? I don't know. It, it's a tough one because live music on a whole has been struggling because all the venues are closing down. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's far less venues for bands to play and tour. You know, if I wanted to go and put on a show for on a Saturday night somewhere, it's hard to find somewhere to do it now. And with the mainstream media not covering our music at all, mm-hmm. and that's not bringing new people into it. And I know when bands like the Stray Cats become pop, became popular, I was already in the music, so I actually didn't follow them when they first came out. But I know a ton of people who say the Stray Cats got them into the music. Mm-hmm. And, and so you need a band to get into the charts or to become commercially successful to get more people interested in the music. And it's not going to be an old band bringing out a new record. No. It's got to be someone totally new that is young and plays the music. Yeah. Especially if they find, like, like Stray Cats did it in their own style. Mm-hmm. And there was other bands in the UK who were getting in the charts, like the Jets were in the charts. There's Shaking Stevens. And even in the 70s, Jungle Rock was in the charts in the UK even though it was a 50 song. So I could see the, in the nineties, uh, you know, you had obviously the Reverend Horn heat and, and the whole psychobilly kind of movement going yeah. on. And a lot of that was pretty underground. They never had the breakout hits that the, the stray cats had, yeah. but it didn't start a new movement. So it didn't, it saw the psychobilly scene grew out of the rockabilly scene, but then brought a lot of new people into the rockabilly scene. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that would be uh, that would be us. By the way, I I was never really the Stray Cats. Didn't, I I mean I knew them um, or whatever, but it wasn't really till the the early '90s that I started listening to like Deadbolt and all of that stuff. Those, those crazy guys, and and yeah. then it led me into full on rockabilly. Yeah. yeah, and then it grows from there because you find you love it, and so if yeah, if the more people you can pull in by getting music out there, the better. A big difference though now is that. When I was younger, you were into one scene. I was into the rock and roll and rockabilly scene. Someone else would be, say, into the mod scene. Someone else might be into the heavy rock scene. And, you know, all these different scenes. And people tended to stick with one. Now, it's totally acceptable for someone to dress 50s to go to a rockabilly club on a Friday night and dress mod to go to a 60s club on a Saturday night. And no one no one minds, which I I think that's a good thing because one of my big regrets with music in life is that I was in London when punk started. And I remember seeing the adverts for all the seventies punk bands playing and I didn't go because Mm -hmm. I was into the fifties scene. So I wasn't going to go to a punk show because yeah, we hated the punks. Yeah. (laughs) And so it's a big regret that I didn't you, take you, you were a Teddy, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> At that time I was, yeah. Um, the, I, the Teddies and the punks are always. I do up. appreciate that also because, um, so it's a little tiny sh- sub genre, but I, all of the beautiful clothes at Viva, I love all of the, um, the vintage wear that people get to break out and wear for everyday life. <laughs> And it, it covers quite a few decades. So being able to wear something from the forties, the fifties, yeah. the sixties and, and appreciate well, what I find funny is how many of the punk acts from the 70s I've got to meet. And, and you've probably seen the photos of Paul Jones from the Sex Pistols wears a Viva Las Vegas t-shirt quite a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went to a friend of mine who has season tickets for Chelsea in England. When I went there one time, um, he's friends with Paul Cook and Steve Jones. And so we all went to the Gal- to the um, Chelsea match together. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I, I would say I, I would say Tom, this is a, co- a compliment to you. It's when, 
we went to uh, Spain for high rockabilly a couple years yeah. ago, and people always want to dog on the other thing, right? So we're at high rockabilly, and they're like, oh, are you guys, where are you from, or the States? They're like, oh, you must be big Viva fans. I'm like, uh, we are big Viva fans. I'm like, oh, that's, they're so big. They're overblown, da 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 And the guy's saying that to me, and he's tipsy, wearing a Viva Las Vegas T-shirt. <laughs> I almost put it in the video, but I didn't because I, I felt it was it was too on the nose. And we didn't want to. We we tried to show people in their best light. Not when it happened light. several times, when we were over there in London or Spain, it somebody would start dogging on Viva, and I'd be like, "Well, what are your concerns about Viva?" And they'd be like, "Well, it's too much of a fashion show, or it's too much of this." I go, "It's it's Las Vegas." I go, and you, "You have to understand, there's it's." It's 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 a it's a it's a rockabilly festival, but it's also American and it's also Vegas. It's it's going to have a lot of things. When I hear that term, not just about Viva, just in general, it's too much of a fashion show. Yeah, that really annoys me. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I'll tell you why. Obviously. Because <laughs> when when people go out, people dress up to go out in every walk of life, in every style of music, people dress up to go out. Yeah. So why should Viva be any different? Yeah. And there's a lot of people don't dress up. No one says, oh, people dress down too much or something like that. No. It, uh, and I think it comes from insecurities. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm but sure it, it does. Yeah. It, I, I, and, I told people, I'd say 50% of the people that are there at Viva aren't dressed to the nines. They're dressed the way they want to dress. And no one says anything about them at all. No one says anything no. about them. You want to wear your dicky shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah. And you probably fine. noticed that high rockabilly. Yeah. Everyone dresses the part. Everyone. Oh yeah. They are all dressed on so point. So much. Yeah. They were dressed yeah. More on point while dogging on V. I was like, it, I'm confused right now. You guys are, I'm like, I need to step up my game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I like high rockabilly. I had a good time when I went there. They, yeah. are, they had lovely things to say about you, by the way, Tom. Actually, yes, I ran into yes. several people, including, your security crew was there. Yeah. The members, yes. We hung out with those guys. Delightful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, oh, as for Viva getting too big, I'm not the one that made it big. It's all the people going to the event that made yeah. it big. Yeah, totally. So uh, for, for, for us, uh, and I don't know if we've ever said this to you directly, but uh, 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 our channel would literally not exist without Viva Las Vegas. Uh, prior to Viva Las Vegas for us, we thought we were the weirdos, and that's what led us into it. Is we went to San Francisco literally for three days just to check out tiki bars and go to rockabilly concerts and some burlesque events that yeah. were going on there. Uh, got back, a friend of mine was having a burlesque, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, bachelor party in Portland. He's like, "Where to go?" I'm like, "Let's take. I'm going to take you to these tiki bars. We're going to go see Red and Horn Heat." Da 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 da. I took him up there. And, and that's when a buddy of mine's like, you need to go check out Viva Las Vegas. That's your scene. And I'm like, what is this Viva Las Vegas place? Do tell us. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, when we showed up, we were like, oh, my gosh, we're not the weirdos. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, the best saying I heard once was that someone actually said, I spend 51 weeks of the year feeling like the odd person out. For one week a year, I fit in. Yep. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? Doesn't yeah, that make you feel is. good? Yeah. <laughs> well, we appreciate Viva because in our what we've seen is that as Viva has gone along, it has definitely pulled people in, and that they go out and they start m more local events of their own, uh, which is a whole other thing. Which we can go into this right now. Which is how in the world have you kept an event that size going for twenty one years? Like that is an twenty three. Twenty three. That's yeah. an impressive feat. In and of itself, I've seen events with 5,000 people just collapse after 10 years. Uh, yeah, what's your secret? I don't know, I don't know if, it's, well, if it's a secret. I couldn't tell you. I'd have to tell you <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually really, really simple. I make sure that when I book everything, it's an event that I would want to pay to go to. Yeah. Simple as that. You don't I, lose track of the, the what what you your vision. You don't lose track yeah. of your vision. I could easily, I could make it far bigger by booking bands that I don't want to book. Mm -hmm. And too many events, they they get started with sort of rockabilly or whatever music it is, 
and then they want more people so they start booking all these other types of music yeah. and here's the thing you got a rockabilly show with this mass of people if you put on say some punk bands you're not necessarily going to get the punk crowd but you're going to lose some of the rockabilly crowd yeah. oh yeah very true. And so when people are if you start an event from the very beginning mixing different genres of music that's one thing but building an event up on one type of music and then trying to add the other music that that's going to kill it i i do think you're right about things like surf and things like that where you're mm -hmm. putting it at that specific venue on sunday only where that that or does work party, yeah. Where yeah maybe if you pulled surf inside and threw that on a thursday and everything like that i don't see it going over as well we occasionally have a surf band in in the piano bar yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah well and then it fits your venue a little bit more too than yes. maybe yeah. if there was in one of the larger rooms yeah um so i have a question for you i know that uh vlv 23.1 is about a year away. I'm not going to wait for you, Tom. <laughs> and I'm sure that there's plenty of planning that you still have to do. Um, but is there anything that you want fans to know about the next Viva coming up? Not the one that didn't happen, but things that maybe you have planned for the one coming up. Yes. <laughs> I've got to word it right. Um... And this, what I'm going to say now, isn't just Viva, it's the entire music scene. It refers to every festival out there, every mm -hmm. music event out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to go ahead. And that's because if the coronavirus has a second wave yeah. in the fall and the winter, that could hit us again. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's quite worrying because obviously it's my livelihood I've already got a year where I've got I can't pay myself any income mm -hmm. and so what I'm doing right now is I'm not finalising anyone I'm not saying to any bands you're definitely on next year mm-hmm and if it does go ahead, and again, the same with every other event out there, if they turn, if the authorities turn around and say, we're going to reduce the capacity of your venues so that everyone's got six feet around them, no event can be cost effective yeah. because you won't be able to get enough people in to make it work. We don't all have to be in the arena only. It just but it would be the same there. So yeah. that would be easier outside at the car show because it's outdoors. Yeah. So right now, until we know what, what the situation is going to be, mm -hmm. that was my computer, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> right now, until we know what the situation is going to be, it's hard to say what I'm going to do. So I've got to organize it being able to take it in different directions depending on what happens yeah be fluid and flexible yeah and that that's it really and this is the first time i'm saying this yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So you, I, I imagine that you probably also have been like met with the orleans and talked to them and they're probably looking at it the same way like what are they gonna uh, do they're closed there's no one there there's yeah. no one for you to talk to <laughs> yeah yeah so they should be going back quite soon um so i'm gonna arrange a meeting with them as soon as i can mm -hmm. i might get a better in better insight on what's happening in vegas because of course yeah. vegas more than any other city relies on visitors going to events yeah so if anyone's going to figure out a way to make it happen it's yeah oh, it's got to be vegas so no one needs to panic yet yes but i'm once i've spoken to them then i'll know a bit more what they're thinking yeah but it could see a total restructure of the whole event how we do it mm -hmm. on the other hand the event could be exactly the same as it has been yeah 
Too early days to know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this would we'll have to see what happens. So if anyone has any ideas, then <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll end this on a we'll end this on a fun note. Yeah. I hear that you have a secret talent, or shall we say, skill that you don't talk about very often that I read about recently. <laughs> I hear that you are yeah. a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. That is correct. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> yeah, nice. So like seventeen years, something like that. Um, is about that many years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Is that is that just that single martial art? Yeah. Just well. Yes, but we've done some other martial arts in the Taekwondo classes, like Hapkido and Kumdo. Kumdo's the Korean version of Kendo. Okay. So, wow. yeah, swords, which is why oh, you can't see it. I've got a sword hanging on the wall there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, that was fascinating. Obviously, you don't talk about it very often. but What, uh, what got uh, you into that? What made you decide? I wanted my son to do something a bit more physical, and I thought he could do with some sort of martial art. So the Taekwondo place was the nearest one to our house. <laughs> so I said, look, it's a family class. I'll come and do it with you to start because my son, I've got an adult son and daughter who live in France. Mm. And so they were over. And so we went and did the class. He did it while he was here, then did a few classes back in France. And that was it. And I stuck with it. And... That's how it came about. It was totally by accident, and I really enjoyed it. And and I do want to go back. I got bad knees, and actually oh from Taekwondo, but not from the reason I thought. I thought it was because of the impact on my knees. But what it is, in Taekwondo, if you're kicking a target, people hold it loosely, so as you kick it, it flings back. Mm -hmm. And so I kept hyperextending my knee. Mm. And I've since discovered if I'm kicking, like in the gym I go to, there's a big heavy bag hanging that doesn't move. It was solid, just pop, pop. Yeah. Pop. And so I'm, it's not aggravating my knees. So I've started kicking again. And yeah. It's about the, yeah, it's definitely about technique and figuring that out. So Yeah. And it's something that, it's a great thing to do to sort of keep you calm in a bad situation. I was actually going to say during this whole situation, it probably is a good way to focus yourself. Yeah. And what I used to do, if I was having a bad day, I would go to Taekwondo. And when we were kicking, I'd imagine if someone annoyed me, their face was on that target. <laughs> <laughs> great. Most of, the, most of the time, it was the guy in England who ripped me off. Oh, oh. <laughs> I don't blame you then. <laughs> um, 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 any crazy Viva stories you want to add? Crazy Viva stories. I, I, I get asked that. And, I know. I'm sure you do. And it's, um, you know, and I try and think it's been odd crazy things. But Go ahead. Yeah, you know, um, it might sound crazy, but Chuck Berry being one of the easiest people to deal with. <laughs> yeah well that is i mean you i guess you probably get to see people at their best and their worst and who they really are so it, you know what it is chuck berry has a contract and there's things on the contract and when he and i'll use one as an example he wanted a certain type of guitar amp and it actually says in his contract if you don't have that exact guitar amp you won't go off stage. And you have to pay him X amount of money in cash for him to go on the stage. So all these stories you hear about him asking for extra money before going on stage, it's because the promoter didn't get the right guitar amp. Mm, they didn't do their job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say uh, that, that makes me rem remember when uh, little Richard was there, I was downstairs in the casino talking to somebody and he smacked into the back of my heel with his wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> I turned around. I didn't know who would hit me. I just turned around and he's like, hey, sorry about that. And I was like, little Richard? Like, I was just like, I just shook his hand. I was like, you can hit me anytime you want. <laughs> but he, 
I'd asked if I could get a photo with him. And he went, after the show, he went to great lengths to make sure that we did the photograph together and sitting on a sofa. And he wanted to make sure that the picture was done properly. So Nice. That's nice. Chuck, Chuck Berry did. No, no. Little Richard. Little Richard. Richard. So Richard. Yeah, I, I got pictures with not all of the acts I've booked, but most of them. Yeah. The sort of the big name acts. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Memories forever. <laughs> yeah. One of the things when it comes to sponsorship for beer is that it's not just for me to get some money from the sponsor, but the beer has to be sold at a sensible price. And as you know, the Orleans sells the big cans of Budweiser for $3, something like that. And that's part of the agreement is that happens. So when you go to a festival and they're selling beers at eight, nine, ten dollars, that's because they're giving a big amount of money to the organizer of the event. Oh, yeah. I, could, I could probably say to Budweiser, I want ten times what you're giving me, just add it on the beer. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, okay. And then you'll be looking at twelve dollars for a can of beer. Yeah. So sponsorship is not necessarily sponsorship yeah and it's you enough. are helping to ensure your um festival goers are yeah, getting a tr trust deal me, on their beer we went to a festival in portland about six seven years ago with about 45 bands and when you went into the festival if you left you could not come back in for the whole day and they only had cans of oh, bottles of heineken for ten dollars each and that was it well, and we're in the microbrew capital of the United States, and they, yeah. really, they had water and Heineken. Yeah. They even had the, uh, what was it? They, they had the signs up for, what's that, the British beer? I uh, can't think of what it was. Newcastle? Newcastle. Yeah. But they, did, but they didn't even have Newcastle. No. Just the signs for it. <laughs> but I couldn't believe the prices that they had on it, and that was their whole thing, where they check every single person coming in there for any alcohol on your person and what you're doing. Then you get in there, and then the burgers were like, and if you leave, it was $16 you can't come for a burger and yeah, fries. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. At their thing. Like, I mean, that's a normal festival. That's a normal yeah. event. Yeah. yeah, see, your earlier question about is about how I've managed to keep Viva going for 23 years. That's part of the reason is that we have that flexibility for people to come and go. So mm -hmm. you can, you don't even, obviously a hotel has lots of restaurants, but if you want, you can go down the road to a burger place or, or wherever you want or to a different place. on the air? The Irish pub across the street. Yeah, I like that. Don't tell them. It's our secret and That's, your secret. <laughs> I, we love going over there. There's always like maybe 20 people in there. You know what I mean? It's like really nice, good quiet, food. and the food is good. Yeah. Yeah. A little dip yeah. out and get right back in. Uh, before I stop, before I stop meeting, eating meat, I used to enjoy these Scotch eggs and the, their shepherd's pie and stuff like that. Yeah. Their breakfast over there is good. Their shepherd's pie is good. They do the, mm -hmm. the full-on uh, Irish and British breakfast over there. Yeah. I enjoy that they have healthier food options than some of the other places. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it would be impossible at the Orleans if you operated it like a standard festival because there's so many people staying at other hotels and things around. I can't even imagine there would be people sleeping on the floor in the yeah. casino if they couldn't leave or if you were trying day. to check doors like you would have to have so much more staff to be yeah to be well now someone door. can come in from another hotel or an airbnb go to the festival go home for the day take you know for an hour or two dip in their pool come back uh and that's how they can keep going until four in the morning and yeah. i'm sure that you had, uh, viva las vegas actually benefits from that you know people yeah. are able to plan a getaway and and like i said earlier that i what always want Viva to be an event that I'd be happy to pay to go to. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been to events where you haven't been able to leave and things have been expensive or there's been nothing to eat for me. And yeah. it's, you know, I don't want to be that person organizing that type of event. Well, yeah. You're, you're also not doing, that's another thing you just brought up, which is so common at almost every music festival we've ever been to is where the only places you could eat are at the food booths inside the venue that they are getting a cut of. Where like at Viva, you could eat at any of the restaurants in the entire casino or go off premises. Or if you really want to, there's some out at the car show. Or there's some 
wherever else, you know what I mean? But yeah. you're not forcing people. They have to eat these $4 tacos at the taco cart. Yeah. Uh, no, they could. Yeah. And I'm gluten free, so there are a lot of places I can't eat. So. Oh yeah, like inside the casino itself, it's yeah. it's tough if you're trying to eat healthy or well, especially for four days straight. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. It yeah. has been our pleasure. Definitely. Uh, appreciate thank you, you coming you. on. Giving us your um, attention this Sunday, and we love tuning in to Rockabilly Radio. So yeah. Tuning in. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure getting to know you a little bit better and um, all the positive yeah. thoughts that we will see you again soon next year. Yeah. Or in the I'm, future after that. I'm sure next year is going to be good. It just might be a little bit different. Right, like, say, gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on fire.